So we'll walk like this to try and keep ourselves horizontal, even though we're not walking on the horizontal. See that? That's how this is designed. Why do you think in martial arts we say that where the head goes, the body goes? That means if I take your center point of balance off, merely by shifting your weight with your own force, and I then translate, I then I'm able to take your head and translate that motion to your head, then the body is just going to continue and follow. This is where you see these old men taking young guys that come rushing them, and they take their wrist, they lock the wrist, they translate that motion to the head, they move the head, and the rest of the body flips right over. And the, the old man's done nothing but step out of the way. <laughs> it's called Tai Sivak. It's the art of avoidance and utilizing their own momentum against them. And where the head goes, the body will fall. This is why, if you're ever in a situation, cup your hands, slap the ear. I can guarantee you that the assailant will fall to the ground for at least five minutes wondering what the hell happened. Because you're overriding all senses. You completely negated all the input that they had about where they are in time and space with balance and posture. And they'll fall to the ground in fetal position crying like babies. It's quite impressive. It is one of the weakest parts of the human body. Separate of, of course, the coronavirus. Right? Which you can always stab at something. Of course, there's always this one. This one's a good one. Right there. See, where the, everybody's got this. See right there? That's a direct path to the lung. Just take a sharp object straight down in there and the lung will collapse. Guaranteed, it doesn't take much either. It's all soft tissue. Right through here, all soft tissue. And if you're lucky and it's an assailant, it's a knife, you'll hit a major artery and they'll bleed right out. Now step back, because it's gonna be. Right, it's gonna be sprinkler all over you. All right? But you'll get away. And the person will have gotten their just desserts. You know what? Guys, a piece of glass right here. A pen right here. A pencil right here. Right? Doesn't take much. A butter knife right here. Doesn't take much. A sharp piece of stick. Don't take much. Screwdriver, whatever. So, that's how delicate we really are. Okay? We really are that delicate. Um... And so the coordination of complex motor movements, the balance and posture with cranial nerve seven and cranial nerve two, they're being integrated by the midbrain. The midbrain's then sending information to cerebellum. Cerebellum then, then would what? Want to send that up to the brain, wouldn't it? Who in the brain, guys, where in the brain is responsible for planned, pre-planned motor movements? What area of the brain is responsible for pre-planned motor movements? You guys got to go back to the cortex. Prefrontal cortex, yes, absolutely, sir, yes, good job. Prefrontal cortex, so would the prefrontal cortex be wired up to the cerebellum? Sure enough, yeah. And then would the primary motor cortex be wired up? Yeah, sure enough, yeah. So now you see how I kept telling you guys that it's looped, everything's looped in circuits, see that guys? And that's why we need multiple layers in the cerebral cortex, and in some cases we need them to be insulated, each layer separate of each other, because they're going in different directions to connect different areas of the brain with other areas? Make sense? Yeah. Again, big picture, guys. A big picture. Okay? So now this clinical scenario. So the lady calls my wife. My wife tells me she's got this dog. Dog's 12 years old. Dog has lost its eyesight within a week. So my, my wife, you know, I'm getting ready for work. And she's, she shows me the picture, CAT scan of the dog. And imagine, CAT scan of the dog. The first thing I'm thinking of is the price. A couple thousand dollars? I'm like, okay. So she shows me the CAT scan, and I look at it, and I look at it, and I see, I see what I should see. So on a CAT scan or an MRI brain, guys, it's really quite fascinating. On a CAT scan, Let's talk about MRI first. So on, a, on an MRI, anything that's fatty has large amounts of hydrogens. Got me, guys? 
because fatty acids have large amounts of hydrogen. Sure enough, in an MRI, now we're going physics here. Ready? In an MRI, you flip the switch. Turn the switch on, magnets on. Turn the switch on, magnets on. Well, when you turn the magnet on, in the presence of these fatty acids, the hydrogens of those fatty acids, they come to attention depending on how strong the magnetic field. So when you turn, when it's a real strong magnetic field, you turn it on, hydrogens, more hydrogens come to attention. Stronger the magnetic field, more hydrogens come to attention. And when you shut it off, then the hydrogens go back down to ground state. With that, they release a signal. The machine receives that signal, paints a picture. How interesting. The MRI is really based on H and MR, which is the basis of organic chemistry. It's how protons react in the presence of a magnetic field because protons are positively charged. Does that make sense? And the magnetic field's negative. So we get these signals, and there's different signal strengths depending on the number of hydrogens and the carbons and who's next to the carbons and the carbons next to the carbons and the oxygen is next to the carbons and the nitrogen is next to the carbons and the hydrogen is oxygen. Is next to the so you get all these different signals. And they, they were able to, because of the advent of these large, massive computers becoming smaller, they were able to crunch all these numbers, all this data, and be able to extrapolate pictures from signals of hydrogens and fatty acids that are called to attention in the presence of a magnetic people when it's on and off. Quite amazing, isn't it? And from that, we can see a whole bunch of stuff. So the brain in an MRI, the brain, bone will look white white and the brain will look dark any blood that's in the brain will look white so when you take an MRI and there's blood you, you suspect some kind of brain leak blood leak either in the in the dura matter or under the dura matter between the erectile matter and dura matter or within the brain itself you're going to see huge white because fresh blood is white old blood is gray now when you switch it, so there's a, a T1 MRI and a T2 MRI. The T2 switch it. Now, the bone comes out gray and the, and the brain comes out white. See that? That's MRI. CAT scan, bone always comes out white. You got me? Because it's basically an x-ray. And the brain comes out like shades of gray. So here I'm looking at a CAT scan. I see the white bone, and I see the shades of gray. But when I'm looking at the mass, when I'm looking at the mass, and it should be, so imagine, again, imagine this being gray, right? The mass should look like this, nice and gray, and uniform in color. Within that uniform gray, I'm seeing these rings, and in a hyalinization, like a darkening, like a different color altogether within the tissue of the brain in multiple sites. Of course, what do you think, guys, what do you think one of the symptoms of this dog is? If it's in the cortex, and if it's an area of the brain that's responsible for the frontal look, that's, around, uh, 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 that's involved with pre-planned motor movements, or this other structure. Remember I told you that, that the this, this, this cerebral hemispheres They have what? Remember, I, just, I broke this down to you before? They have a cortex and a medulla, yes? And in the medulla, they have what? These misnomered basal ganglia, when they should be called basal nuclei. Those are the caudate nuclei, yeah? And the cortex has the gray matter, and these guys, these are nuclei, but then there's white matter in the medulla. So you got these and that. And then, and then, of course, the medulla has all the striations of the neurons going up, down, axons going up, and down. So, if 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 I have these lesions, these lesions with these rings in the basal ganglia, we said basal ganglia is responsible for what? Smoothing out motor movements, right? So, if I have a disease of that, then I have Huntington's, or I have. Parkinson's, right? Or even some movement disorders in Alzheimer's. 
affect these ganglia. And so people who have Alzheimer's will get movement disorders as well, especially as the, degree, as the disease progresses. It starts in the cortex, so it affects memory first. Yeah? Then if it targets the prefrontal cortex, then more pre-planned motor movements. Then if it gets down to the medulla, oh, now, now it's uncoordinated movement. See? Uncoordinated movement. So the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, cranial nerve 2, cranial nerve 8, the midbrain, they're all linked. And the tension on the muscle is constantly giving this information back because you need to monitor balance and posture if you want to live in this world. You know what I mean? Very important is how it's all linked. Big picture, guys. Big picture, right? I want you guys to walk away with a good integrated approach of what's going on here because I, I would love to teach you neuroscience in four moments, right? And we could get really deep and dirty with it. But I'm just trying to give you overview. What would take you whatever hours to read in the textbook, I'm giving it to you in 15 minutes flat. So this idea then is that this dog didn't have a lesion just in the basal ganglia. So sure enough, what would you have? Uncoordinated mortar movements. So now the dog is walking, and you can see he's jittery. He's got ones in the prefrontal cortex, so it's hard for him to initiate movement. Huh? Hmm? But the balance and posture is not off. So once he gets up, once he gets up, he's able to walk, or she. Once she gets up, she's able to walk. But it's hard for her to initiate the movement. And... And of course, there's starting to be a little bit of the jitters. So sure enough, she's got one in the cortex. And if it's in the area of the prefrontal cortex, you could get epilepsy. You see? Fire too little, then I get like kind of catatonic state. Fire too much, now I get epileptic seizures failing of the limbs. Make sense? Guys, we covered, there's so many different diseases that I'm just randomly throwing off at you here. Because again, it's about the bigger picture. Too little or too much? And what is the function? So if we're talking about basal ganglia, oh, too little, then I'm in catatonic state. Too much, then I've got, I've got the dyskinetic disorders. All right? Parkinson's versus Huntington's versus Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, you get the catatonia. When it's severe enough, the disease, Alzheimer's, once it starts affecting this basal ganglia, Shuffling of the gate, they don't pick up their feet, they don't swing their hips, nothing. And then they forget to walk. So now they're in a wheelchair for the rest of their lives because they forget, they've forgotten to even walk. See how debilitating this stuff can be, guys? All right? So Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and Parkinson's. All right? Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's. Okay? ALZ, Alzheimer's. Hunting tons. tons. And then Parkinson's. What other one? The, the guy from SpongeBob, he died. 57 years old. What did he die of? ALS. Same thing that Stephen Hawking died from. Same thing that Luke Garrick died from. What is ALS? Anybody know? Isn't that from um, So no, so the ALS, they believe, they don't know what actually causes it, but they believe it's initiated by autoimmune. And what they're targeting is the myelinations. So ALS targets the lateral tracts that you have motor running down and, and remember the spinothalamic neurons that are bringing sensory information up in the lateral white matter tracts of the spinal cord? In ALS, uh, yeah, in ALS, it's those that get affected. So you're gonna get motor to skeletal muscle, and when it, it, then when it affects the diaphragm, then you're dead. So ALS, there's other diseases. There's uh, I, I, the central canal, when the central canal swells, it's called syringomyelitis, it's another disease. Um, this dog, sure enough, what I suspect is that this dog, with what it had inside the brain tissue, I suspect, that the dog had some form of viral meningitis that led to a possible viral encephalitis 
and even a secondary bacterial encephalitis. Sure enough, funguses, there are funguses that can also cause the brain to swell, and that's what the word encephalitis means, guys. Swelling of the brain versus swelling of the meninges. Understand? If I swell the meninges, then I increase the risk for infection of the brain itself. And now that makes sense, doesn't it? Now that we know that there are immune cells inside the meninges that communicate with the brain to tell the brain its normal function. Makes sense, doesn't it? I love it. So, you know, I, I told her, I was like, like, she's in a lot of pain, she's suffering, and I don't suspect she's going to get any better. The doc's, the doc's like, yeah, we're going to give her uh, anti-inflammatories. And I'm like, it's false hope. Do you think that the anti-inflammatories are going to take away, if you think anti-inflammatories are going to take away those lesions, of, but and what happens? Those lesions, these lesions have something in it, and you can look it up. It's called liqua, liqua, uh, liquefactive necrosis. That's like the death of the neuron, and then just fluid accumulation, and then and then it, get, it gets walled off. Now, you can imagine. Remember, there there's something else that causes a form of encephalitis. Yes, remember we talked about it. Prions cause a spongy, spongioform encephalitis. To make the brain look like sponge. Remember, this is the only infectious protein in the world that we know of, at least until we get back from Mars. Why do you say that? Because we don't know. We didn't, know, we didn't know that this existed on, on Earth. This is mad cow disease, by the way. Guys. It's also referred to as, so this causes, in humans, this causes uh, Krupfeldt-Jacobs disease. I forget how to spell it. Krupfeldt-Jacobs, Krup, I think it's Krupfeldt-Jacobs disease. CJD and in cows, it's called mad cow disease. So you got ALS, Huntington's, Parkinson's, viral meningitis, viral encephalitis. You've got bacterial meningitis. There are bacterial meningitis too, so it's possible. There's fungal meningitis too. It's it's it, it's I I know of a female who died. She she grew roses. She was a 35-year-old female, presenting in the ER with a sinus infection. Did you hear me? What did I tell you? Cranial nerve 1 and cranial nerve 2. Sinus infection, cranial nerve 1. Cranial nerve 1. Why? Because the nerves of cranial nerve 1 are sitting in the ethmoid bone. So if you get a viral bacteria or fungal infection right in, seated right into the olfactories, they can go right up into the olfactory tract, which is what? A tract. Straight the brain through the meninges. Not even touch the meninges. She came in with a sinus infection. Three days later, she died. People, when the doc, who, when the, the attending ER found out that, that he had died, he had sent all of the information about the CAT scan and everything to the specialist that was supposed to see her. Because he was supposed to, they were supposed to together, they were supposed to do the report on the death. And what they found out was that she had, she was an avid, they didn't ask the right questions. She was an avid gardener who would toil in the soil regularly. And in the soil, what, fecal material, fertilizer, decomposing. Who eats, who's the decomposers in the world? Funguses are the decomposers of the world. So she's there and... Sure enough, she breathed in the spores. Went straight up into the olfactories and right back into the brain, causes the brain to swell. Right? So that's a fungal, that's a fungal encephalitis. It's that easy if you breathe enough of them in and it's at that life cycle where they're releasing those spores and you breathe enough of them in, 
If it doesn't seed in your lung and then go to the brain, you're going to go straight to the brain through the olfactory nerves. This is dangerous, man. This stuff is dangerous. This stuff is dangerous. This world we live in is dangerous. Makes It makes life that much more pleasurable, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Knowing that you could die at any moment. Doesn't it? It makes it more pleasurable, doesn't it? The fact that you're alive right here, right now, and not dead, makes you think twice, doesn't it? It does. Guys, I mean, this, and so sure enough, this dog, this is all the things that are going through my head as I'm looking at this scan. You imagine that. Of course, and then my next thing is I go and I look it up in my pathology book. And sure enough, I find a slide, because that's what pathology books do. They plot lots of slides and pictures of brain. And that nice ring with that hyalinization, with that liquefactor necrosis, toxoplasmosis gondii. And she proceeded to tell me a story about a raccoon who tried to enter her house through her dog's little swing swing gate, swing door. You never know. All right? You never know where he got it from, but the dog definitely has something that it definitely caused massive damage along with loss of eyesight. That eyesight's not coming back. Brain's permanently damaged. She's lucky. It, I mean, she, now she's having seizures too. So my, she's got the seizures, loss of eyesight, all this other stuff. If it was my dog, I'd put it down. I wouldn't even pay to get in the. I wouldn't. I wouldn't pay to get the X-ray done because it's just. It's just telling you what, you, what I already, what I could have already told you for free. She said four thousand dollars. She's in the hole right now with the dog. Has it changed the dog's condition now? No. So why bother? I, I do it to myself. It's not going to change my condition. What the hell for, man? Just let me ride it out, baby. Okay? That's it. It's mine. Why, why, why do I want to know if I got cancer for? Just let it eat me from the inside out, man. I don't care. If I got it anyway, more than likely I got it anyway. So sure enough, sure. Let's get it over with. Okay? Or I'll try to cheat it as best as I can. Next few years. It's all right. So six, seven... All right, six, seven, and eight there, guys. Then you got nine, 10, uh, 11 comes midline, and it hooks and leaves. And then 12 is right, I mean, uh, 12 is, yeah, 12 is like somewhere in between there, kind of like inferior and eight, so there, like 12. So it'll be crane number nine, Cranial number 10, which is the vagus. Cranial number 11, which has several roots to it. And then this one, cranial number 12, which is high, uh, hypoglossals going straight to the tongue. All right, for the movement of the tongue itself. All right, the tongue gets pulled, the muscle gets pulled when it gets stimulated. So when it, if the nerve is bad, the tongue will deviate to the side, all right? The tongue will deviate to the side that's working, so it's the side that's opposite that's not working. You know what I mean? Because the muscle will contract on the side that works and pull the tongue towards the one side instead of pulling it straight out because they're both working bilaterally together to pull the tongue out. So when this one's not working, then it stays lax. The tongue, this part of the tongue stays in, and the tongue deviates to the side opposite the lesion. Of course, I would never test them. That's what that's clinical. So if someone comes in, I ask them, stick out your tongue. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the right side. Hypoglossal. And so I'm looking for some kind of compression on the nerve, or I'm looking for some kind of damage, guys, at the level of the medulla. Does that make sense? So again, to review, cranial nerve one and two are up near the cerebral hemispheres. Above the diencephalon, they're going to give branches down to the diencephalon because the thalamus requires so. Everyone agree? Also, don't forget, cranial nerve two is, is as it comes down, it's going to drop off branches to the midbrain because it wants midbrain wants to integrate sight and sound on the posterior side. Got me? Then I come to midbrain, cranial nerve three and four coming out at the level of the midbrain. Four is coming from the back side of the brain stem. Cranial nerve three is coming from the front side of the brain stem. Come down to the pons level, only cranial nerve five is coming out in the pons. Yeah? Then I come down to the level of the pons and the medulla, I got six, seven, and eight. All online, but medial, then lateral, then most lateral. Got me? Then 
Cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, and then 12. So, what? 9, 10, 11, and 12 are, mid, are in the medulla. Got me? So, 3, 4 midbrain, 5 pons, 6, 7, and 8 at the junction of the pons with the medulla, and then 9, 10, 11, and 12 in the medulla. Got me, guys? And why is this important? Because you got to keep in mind, all these have nuclei in them. These all have nuclei in them. You see why the medulla is not, and the pons is not just some straight little tube? It's swollen structure. So is the medulla. It's a swollen structure. Because why? It's got all these nuclei. It's got to relay all this information. And separately, you got what? Sensory information coming up. It's going to go all the way up to the diaphragm. And motor information is coming down. It's going to pass through all this stuff and not stop. It can stop. It will stop. It will want to stop for balance and posture, stuff like that. You know, drop off here and there and everything else, integrating and everything else. And then whew, through the medulla, and at the medulla, I'm going to cross. So the only one that I'm going to hold you responsible for, guys, the only one, the only track I'm going to hold you responsible for, out of all the motor tracks that exist, is going to be your cortical spinal tracks. And there's two of them there's the lateral. And the anterior. Okay? Sure enough, the lateral cortical spinal tracts, I believe they come they crisscross at the level of the medulla and they come down opposite, on the opposite side of the spinal cord than what they were in the brain. The anterior laterals. They're going to come down the same side of, the, of where they came off the brain, off the cerebral hemisphere. They're going to come down the same side through the spinal cord. But when they get to the level of the spinal cord, they're going to crisscross to the opposite side at the level of the spinal cord. Did you hear me? And that's why syringomyelia, the disease with the swelling of the central canal, is so important. Because you're going to have a sensory and a motor loss with that disease. Okay? So when you're talking about spinal cord segment when you're talking about spinal cord segment and you got your H's you got your central canal there well remember we said that there's sensory information right the sensory information that comes in here it decides that you know what yeah I need to cross and rise up through lateral. You hear me? And then I'm gonna go up all the way to the thalamus on the same side. And then I'm gonna go up to the brain on the same side. Because I already crossed at the medulla. You got me? That's sensory information. But sure enough, those, those anterior cortical spinal tracts from the right side, they're coming down from the right side, not having crossed, they're coming from brain all the way from the cerebral hemispheres, coming down. And what they'll do, they'll come, they'll come through the lateral tracts, and they'll, they'll drop these fibers off that will come over to the opposite side. You see that, guys? And over here is where you have your motor going out. So, uh, that one, this would be your, well, it would be more like, more like here, so it's anterior then come in because this will be more lateral. All right? So it's your anterior cortical spinal tracts versus your lateral, which are going to come into here. All right? They already crossed the below the medulla. They're, they're going to get, so if they're coming on this side, they cross the below the medulla, they're coming down, they're going to pop off and give a branch right here. So your laterals will come down to a branch right there on the same on this because they cross the below the medulla, whereas this is what's straight up to the right. So just know cortical spinals, and then for sensory, the dorsal column and medial meniscal pathway, and the uh, uh, spinothalamic tracts, which have lateral and anterior portions. That 2080 split, just like just like the motor. 
Those are the only ones that you guys need to know out of what's in the textbook, okay? Don't focus on none of the nuclei and the thalamus or the hypothalamus or none of that other stuff, all right? Again, keep, you know, go back and focus on the, on, on the videos, right? Because my, my tests are coming straight from what I talk about.